Hey guys, so uh, first off, this is me after riding a motorcycle for uh, from Oceanside, California to Durant, Oklahoma, where the uh, WSOP circuit event is going on in 26 hours, including a little bit of rest in El Paso, on a crotch rocket in November. And not only did I freeze my ass off, but I think I got my neck uh, underneath the helmet here. I got my neck like sunburned or maybe wind burned because there's no windscreen on a crotch rocket. Um, so instead of making myself look presentable, I thought this was uh, I thought this was hilarious. So why not go for it? All right. So K court you saw from the title, kangaroo court. So that's. Uh, let me read the definition here. It's an official court held by a group of people in order to try someone generally regarded as guilty. And so in the parlance of uh, Navy and Marine Corps fighter pilots, K-Court is a massive drunk fest where if you're not, um, if you're new to the squadron in your first tour or not uh, kind of mid-level management, you uh, will get stories regaled about you that are often not true or just have hints of truth. And uh, everybody has a good laugh, has a few drinks, maybe a few more, uh, piles on. And in the end, um, call signs are assigned to, uh, to all the, again, uh, the, the guys that aren't in management. If you're, uh, uh, especially if you're a captain or a lieutenant, you're getting a, a new call sign at these, or, or you're affirming your old call sign if it's just so great that it has to stay with you forever, which if you did something awesome and stupid, um, it probably will stay with you forever until you do something more awesome or more stupid. So these call signs are either um, based on something you did, like boomer or boom boom, if you blew your tires on landing, um, Slappy was a guy in my squadron who slapped a general officer um, at the officer's club after a few cocktails. Or it's based on um, like your name, like Yogurt. Yogurt was a call sign for uh, uh, Mr. Cannon. So Yogurt Cannon, um, Smokes, Smokes Johnson um, was another good one. Or it'll be some some acronym, some clever acronym that people like. So anyway, just a little segue about uh, call signs, what happens in a fighter, uh, uh, at least a Navy Marine Corps fighter pilot K court, and a lot, of the good, really a good time. Uh, often you don't remember everything. Uh, you try to get a secretary that uh, isn't going to um, imbibe too much, so that they can remember all of the details and what everyone's call signs end up being and uh, you kind of go from there. So I don't want to take anything from the greats, like uh, Pappy did uh, awesome work with um, just the OCD of going through all of the Mike Postle stuff, absolutely fantastic. Um, in fact, you're doing a, uh, a live stream right now with the, uh, about the Player of the Year stuff and uh, I don't have, I missed the start of that, so I'll have to watch the, the recap on YouTube or, or watch the episode on YouTube uh, a little later, probably when I'm back on the motorcycle. Uh, Pappy, Chai Town, uh, Joey, um, always, always cracks me up from my perspective because Pappy to me and to pilots means something, right? There's, uh, there's three types of landing indicators to tell you um, your glide slope, whether you're, you're coming in too steep you're high, coming in too shallow, or uh, kind of coming into just right, right? And uh, so the picture I put up here, the one on the left is is the Pappy system. Um, it's horizontal lights. There's a Vassy system, which is kind of vertical lights. And then for the real ballers around, there's the Fresno lens. If uh, if you're able to land, you know, you're a carrier aviator. That's how you land aboard um, an aircraft carrier. So Air Force peeps uh, need not apply for that one. Uh, I guess the other Pappy reference that I said is partially a figment of my imagination is a little movie from the 80s about fighter pilots. No, not that one. Uh, not Top Gun, but uh, Iron Eagle. I think it was 1986. Um, the premise being this Air Force brat, teenager, I don't know, 16, 17 years old, is uh, just naturally the best fighter pilot that ever lived. Incidentally, played by Jason Gedrick, um, who 
displays the poker tournament scene recreationally from time to time, um, which is always fun. I played at a table with him at an event at the bike. But uh, Pappy Chappy is played by uh, Louis Gossett Jr. And um, anyway, old movie. Check it out. Pappy, Runway Lights, and, uh, and the Colonel in Iron Eagle is really chappy. So I rolled in Oklahoma around 8 o'clock uh, local time, so 6 o'clock Vegas time, California time. Saw the tweet from Matt Glantz. That's what got, got piqued my curiosity. Uh, I said, can this be real? Um, I jumped onto YouTube, did a quick search. There was nothing there. Just the, the D-Negs uh, vlogs came up about POI. Um, and then I, so I dug into the, the 2 plus 2, the uh, pocket fives, and many, many, many tweets. I scrolled through and kind of captured all that, and we'll just piece that together. Um, and then I thought we could dive into some perspective on the WSOP, something we're not really talking too much about. Um, we've got some interesting thoughts on that, and as well as kind of walk through some of the DNEG's proposals on POI and how that might affect somebody with maybe that may have the best sort of amateur year ever uh, but doesn't have the bankroll to do um, big 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 quote unquote championship events other than the main event or something like uh, the poker players championship Digging the hair. <laughs> uh, looks like a wig. But all right, so basically the tweet that caught my eye is this one here with uh, from Matt Glantz. Ooh, let me read that to you real quick. Major play of the year drama unfolding. Imagine thinking you won player of the year, but you didn't due to a clerical error. Imagine thinking you didn't win player of the year, but you did due to a clerical error. Clerical error. Or... Gross negligence, another thing we call that. Imagine being three of 11 in final event. This is one just a mistake. This is not just a mistake. I'm gonna get into that in a second. But you need fifth place to win player of the year, but you only need a ninth. Um, so this is what get, get, got me reading all the tweets and led me to the two plus two and pocket fives articles. Um, people are bringing up, let's just look at those real quick. So this is this um, Alex uh, Iskander. So Iskander on two plus two or Alex Alinsky, Russian, who was fantasy poker fantasy player. Noticed the points were off in the summertime. Points were often off, or you know, from time to time, and they would correct themselves. Points are typically not posted till an event was finished. He just thought this was an oversight, you know, well, which it was, right? <clears throat> Basically, this event 68 and event 87 matched completely from 32nd place all the way to 47th place. So those 15 people all got their horse results overwritten onto the $1,000 no limit um, Hold'em online bracelet event to include D-Negs who did not cash that event. So he got 213.1 points he shouldn't have, which is basically his horse performance applied to the No Limit online event for some reason. Yeah, and people are like, how can, you know, if he's got that up on his vlog um, with all the events, including the event he did not place in, he must be in on it, he must have known about it. It doesn't really tell us much though because he didn't put that graphic together right and he said hey just put a breakdown of all my scores and you know you could get that off the wsop website um various sources you can just look at the link for the joey video he goes through the timeline who knew what when um nothing really nefarious with any of that <clears throat> although the point that that sean deeb and doug polk both mentioned via twitter is that as insanely interested in this as Dean Eggs is you know once he was a contender with his second place finish in the 100k in Vegas he would have definitely noticed if he was missing 200 points right it's 5% of his total 
um, he would make sure that was there. So it's just really hard to believe he didn't notice an extra 200 points. Um, I don't see how we'd ever know that. And at this point, it's just a sort of made up thing that based on what we know about somebody, what we could expect kind of thing. Um, anyway, so this is the WSOP um, response finally. And they made a statement, sincere congratulations to Rob, sincere apologies. And they explained basically what happened. So I'll leave that up on the screen while we talk about the WSOP and their negligence and the steps that happened there. Okay, we start by looking at uh, Joey's Twitter here, the tweet he sent out at 327, how could the WSOP have the correct results of points on July 15th and then July 16th results for an online event two weeks earlier are changed. So, you know, basically in summary, the online thousand dollar no limit hold them, all of the Places were entered. Jalen Magrano uh, did not place in that um, originally, and then after the horse event, some kind of copy paste in their system. Um, those uh, those uh, results were overwritten, and that's what Seth Polanski is going to get into. If I scroll down, this is on me, so he's taking responsibility. That's good, right? The first 15 people to cash in event 87, spots 32 through 46 were instead uploaded. At event 68 by mistake in our back end basically overwriting um, just so happened to include Negrano among the 15 Joey then gets into talking about the process um, and then Seth Polanski talks about drop down menus well, these drop down menus I mean you can't not expect this to happen I mean look uh, Daniel was very gracious that hey mistakes happen right everyone can get behind mistakes do happen but this is um, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue whether there's a prize or not if there's any commercial value to winning player of the year and Daniel and others have argued that there is um, that's that's something of value that needs to be properly accounted for and audited um, you think of like when McDonald's runs their Monopoly promotion, uh, it's going to be audited by one of the big um, audit companies every single time, KPMG or uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, um, etc. So, um, yeah, it's insane. So the fact that any employee in the cashier area with, you know, you go back there with your winning ticket and they put in your information, they give you your tax forms, um, and they can just, well, I guess it's at the kiosks before you do all that. So I misspoke at the kiosks where you're sent to get your sort of uh, colored piece of paper that's how you placed and your, your information's put in there. Those individuals have access to overwrite uh, games that have already been entered. I mean, this is, this is like data security 101 happens to be my business um, data strategy security um, yeah like once those are certificated and authenticated by the powers that be when the event is officially closed out nobody can ever access that uh, you know except for like the one god person uh, you know maybe we have pappy pappy's the one person that can access this uh, if an investigation proves that he needs to access. It's insane. So the way in any normal contest that has any commercial value from you know sort of a large revenue profit perspective would be you know data entry. Um, there's a comment in here that no you know the human error could could never you know you know it's always going to be there. Well, it, no. It, it's not. You can completely eliminate it with, with it's, it's more resources, right? It's more human resources. It's other technologies to make sure that you have it right. Um, it's somebody signs off on it. Somebody approves. It's quality control that you always have in like in the aviation. The person that does the maintenance on your airplane can't sign off that the flight controls are done correctly. Somebody else has to watch. They have a different level of supervision, right? 
So those are different things you can do about human uh, stuff. Obviously, there, there's other data security technologies that make a lot of sense for something like this. But all that said and done, the event is closed out, and nobody, <laughs> nobody can make a change to that. Except maybe there's a committee that things can be escalated to, and we know we made a mistake, and we're on the path to correct it. But that that just exists, and then, and then you have the audit step, right? You bring in one of the uh, financial audit companies that monitors your entire process. It gives you somebody to to point the finger at and say, "Look, it's attested to. It's right." You never have to worry about this again. The reason why it matters is because it's the WSOP who is saying, here's what the point totals are so far for something of value, even though there's no prize, there will be a prize. It's just a semantic, right? Here's something of value. Here's who's in what position. They were tweeting out, right? Their marketing arm is tweeting out that Sean D needed fifth place and these are what the numbers are. So all along the way, they're saying, this is what the score is. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, certainly culpable. They did not have the um, risk mit mitigation steps in place. They didn't have any kind of audit capability. And you know, from a basic security lens perspective, everybody could go in there and, uh, with the power, of, with the apostle-like power of God, go in there and change previous events just with a simple clerical error. It makes no, absolutely no sense. And yeah, the my um, never been to law school mind says this is just screaming for a lawsuit. And hopefully um, something they're able to fix in the future. Hopefully they watch this uh, or something similar and not only fix this insane process where anyone can accidentally change previous events, but put in the appropriate audit steps so that we can hang our hat on the numbers if they're on a billboard or a flat panel hang on the wall that says this is the top six this is the top ten everybody knows that's not going up in, until it's actual facts and this is the way it is spec to the suggestions player of the year uh, this is coming from someone's perspective you know haven't had tons of success in the world series of poker or anything like that but i think i'm an interesting i don't know voice on this just talking to rec players there's two five 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 players five ten players who who also play tournaments um, and a lot of us feel like you know we're gonna get our shot one day right and that's what keeps people coming back to the WSOP in Vegas anyway um, every single year it's okay this is the year I go super deep in the main this is the year I'm gonna satellite into the, the poker players championship this is the year I'm gonna final table X, Y, and Z, whatever the case may be. With that lens, I, I think if you did do well in the main and you had a significant score somewhere else and maybe you made a final table, I, I think you should be in the conversation. Um, and let's just, let's just, let's just uh, kind of general. So I think a, a lot of the discussion on Twitter that uh, DNEX has been spearheading, and I, I think it's great. I think it's great work because... I would agree that something does need to change. Um, but a lot of kind of analytical people, at least analytical thought process and the way I think about it, people saying, well, you can you can use scaling factors, right? And so you can do that throughout. And I think that would be a good start to maybe say, it's not entirely white, it's not entirely black, but there's some shading of gray that we can um, make the system make a little more sense to more people but still not take away from, you know, this other side that, that makes sense for her as well. So just going through the, the DNAG list that, that's on, I'm looking at his uh, Full Contact Poker site. He's got a blog section where his response was to finding out the bad news on the player of the year. So the first thing he talks about is limit the number of caches that count towards your total to 12. Um, so I've heard this from him from a couple of months now, right? and. I gotta tell you, I don't know how I feel about that. So the problem is if you take all of the nuance of saying championship events, $10,000 entry championship events are gonna be like mega points. Um, and let's say you're well above average and you can cash a third of those or um, to DNEG's point, 
you, you're not going to catch very likely at all if it's a hundred person field of professionals that do seven triple draw or do seven no limit whatever the case may be just for an example um so you're gonna have to fire more bullets than that so you know 10k a pop what i'm saying is your 12 best performances need to be championship events by kind of the the, the way Dan, daniel thinks about it so you know if it's one out of every three you're cashing because you're really 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 good that's that's 400 grand um i don't know it's interesting again my whole thing is if you do well in the main or you do well in the ppc like one of those two things that should be a big anchor um that if you played even a partial series and had some uh, moments of brill brilliance throughout the series you should be in the conversation for uh, player of the year now maybe that'll never happen it's always going to be guys like deeb and negrano um and people getting uh two bracelets in big field events something like that um, but it's the way i think about it and also let me just get on the uh, semantics horse maybe it's the uh computer engineering computer engineering me or something but um a min cash in a 3,000 player field is much easier than a min cash in a 100 player field. 10k buy in mixed event. So I think he means 10k buy in mixed event. The poker games that that a mixed game consists of, or that typically find themselves in a mixed game. So whether that's eight game or horse, or there's a couple other variants at the World Series, right? But that's not a 10k buy in mixed event by definition. Like, take 8-game, for example. No Limit Hold'em is one of the events in 8-game. So if a 10K stud event is a mixed game, then a 10K No Limit game is also a mixed game. You see what I'm saying? So the context here is any game that's not PLO or No Limit Hold'em equals mixed game because it's things that typically consist of mixed game. And you can talk about the... Um, history of horse and, and the eight game mix and uh, anyway I think it's interesting it's semantics but uh, yeah so I would agree those are very difficult but you're also yeah I don't know what the answer is right um, I think the 15% payout is definitely part of the problem which which is mentioned here right um, we could probably keep the payouts the same because then it appeals to more rec players because more rec players, hey, I cash in the World Series of Poker, but why does it need to count for player of the year? I mean, that's an instantaneous change that everyone can get behind. Let's make it back to 12%, right, for player of the year points. You could even be more stringent than that, but 12% is probably the next best move because it was there for so long. Um, maybe it's 10% before you get any player of the year points. I think everyone would be just fine with that. And then it could also vary, right? Um, you could do some, some special features for certain events that you wanted. The venue wants the profit, wants to have as many rebuys as they can and many buy-ins as they can in something like Colossus. Um, maybe it's one of those things where you don't get player of the year points until day two, right? Or until, like, yeah, assuming each flight makes the money on day one, I'm thinking of... Uh, can't recall exactly Colossus, I'm thinking of like the Giant, for example, right? So you could cash at the, towards the end of day one, it's kind of a, almost a turbo format, um, but maybe you don't get player of the year points. And again, that's probably tied to the 10 or 12% or whatever the case may be, but I think that would be a great way for people to understand it, right? So in general, it could be a 10 or a 12% payout, and then certain events with multiple, multiple day ones could be, hey, you've got to make day two or day three to get player of your points and every kind of, everyone knows what's what's expected there. And the last point I was kind of touching at is while it's easier to min cash a 3,000 player field, especially a 15% payout, um, than say a 100 person event, it's easier to make a final table um, 100% right at the large buy-in or even the games other than No Limit Hold'em and PLO. So in case in point, the final table I made last summer was the 1500 uh, stud. And that was a little bit bigger because it was a 1500 and not a 10k. 
but think about that. I mean, the, the final 50 players, uh, I don't remember exactly how many people played that, maybe 200 and something. Um, but the last 50 players are the same exact players that are in the 10. My point is a $10,000 seven card stud field of 130 players versus a 1,500 seven card stud field with double that um, is it necessarily, shouldn't be worth five times more points because it's a 10K buy-in, right? Um, but both of those things are much easier to final table than a, uh, the main event. Right, so what did we learn? Um, should we assault? We have our cake court. It's concluded. Should we assign the, uh, the call signs? Dean Eggs already got his call sign. He's plastered it on his vehicle. But, you know, you can't sign your own call sign. So if we can think of a better one, let's go for it, right? Um, Robert Campbell, he's automatically got to be a soup. He's Soup Campbell. Campbell's Soup. I'm going to call him Soup every time I see him. Hopefully I see him from time to time. Uh, Pappy. Well, I, I love Pappy. So maybe we won't assign call signs today. But if you like the content, you like the idea of doing a poker... Um, Kate Court, hit me up, hit the uh, thumbs up, drop me a comment. And as I see things on Twitter, I'm thinking these things are going to target, uh, not the explanations out of the way, you know, five to seven minutes, just let you know what's going on. Um, as always, subscribe if you like the content and feel free to retweet and spread the word. That would be most appreciated as I'm just starting out. And, um, Talk to you soon.